uh, talk uh, mostly about current and future changes in, in climate and weather extremes. So I'm not going to talk at all about solutions, um, but only about uh, the, the, the climate situation um, itself uh, from um, a climatological point of view. And of course, I will uh, use um, much information from the latest uh, IPCC report published um, a little more than a month ago. Um, because that's um, the information that's the freshest. But to have an overall uh, picture, I'd like to start with this slide, which describes the situation uh, in 10 words um, about climate change. Uh, first two words is, uh, it's real. Global warming is happening. I mean, it's now extremely clear to, it should be extremely clear to everyone that uh, climate change is really changing. Second two words, it's us, because human activity um, through the burning of fossil fuels, coal, oil and gas, and also through deforestation, uh, is the main cause uh, of the um, warming, uh, that uh, the disruption uh, that we are uh, seeing. The next two words are experts agree. There is a very wide uh, scientific consensus uh, on uh, the climate change um, understanding and uh, particularly about the fact uh, that it's um, caused uh, mostly by human activity and the burning of fossil fuels and uh, deforestation. Next two words, it's bad because the impacts are starting uh, to become serious uh, on people, but also on ecosystems. And we know that we depend uh, on the good health of ecosystems. And the last two words are the most important, probably. Uh, there is hope. Uh, there is hope because we have the technology, not only the technology, but more broadly the knowledge uh, needed uh, if we want to avoid uh, at least uh, the worst uh, climate impacts. So uh, this is the, uh, the broad context of uh, my speech this morning. I'd like to start by reminding us that we are using and we have been using uh, for two centuries now the atmosphere as a free dustbin for all greenhouse gases and, and CO2 is the main uh, anthropogenic, that means human-created, uh, human-induced uh, greenhouse gas. You know that greenhouse gases are gases which trap heat in the, in the climate system. They let uh, the solar energy uh, coming in, but they don't let uh, the heat that is re-emitted by the surface to exit easily. And that's why there is heat trapping, heat accumulation in the climate system and therefore uh, warming. So it's a little bit as if we were increasing the thickness of a thermal insulation layer around our planet. And we are under that thermal insulation layer. Uh, and under an insulation layer, uh, when you have a source of heat, it means that uh, the heat accumulates. And this comparison with um, a thermal insulation layer actually helps to understand why we need to stop increasing <laughs> excuse me, this thermal insulation layer around the planet. And this is why we need uh, to cut uh, net emissions as quickly as possible uh, to zero. Um, I will certainly come back to this. Just a, a small check because talking to a screen is sometimes a bit abstract. Could someone indicate whether you hear me properly, you see my slides properly, is everything all right? Could someone tell me? There is an abstract problem. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to be sure. <laughs> um, so um, have a look at, to illustrate the point I was making, have a look at this animation. Uh, on the left, you see the CO2. On the right, you see temperature, um, uh, both in both cases uh, globally averaged. So what you see on the left is the concentration, that is the percentage, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere on the average, since 1850. Uh, around the circle, you see the months of the year. It doesn't matter so much. But I like this presentation because it really suggests visually uh, what I was mentioning a second ago, the increase in thickness of that insulation layer around the planet. We went from 280 parts per million in 1850, approximately, to uh, more than 410 uh, this year. 
On the right, you see the temperature and you see that they are both evolving in parallel. That you see the temperature has increased globally uh, by about 1.1 uh, degree C. Uh, and uh, as we will see, it's not only the average temperature which is increasing, but also a number of extreme events uh, changing either in probability or uh, intensity. Another way to look at the evolution of the um, CO2 concentration is this um, diagram showing the evolution over the last 10,000 years. Why is 10,000 10, years uh, uh, an important scale? Because this is the entire period, um, almost, uh, during which civilizations uh, developed, infrastructures were built. Uh, think about uh, harbor and coastal. Uh, infrastructure, for example, cities, etc. And you see that for uh, almost 9,800 years, uh, that concentration was stable, but then it exploded literally over the last 200 years, reaching last May uh, a maximum of 418 parts per million uh, on May 24. There's a, a maximum every year, and it's, uh, it was about uh, then this year. And clearly, this changing composition of the atmosphere and the resulting climate change, sorry, there's a, a typo there, uh, are due to our usage of fossil fuels, uh, to cement also, and to uh, deforestation. Uh, why is the concentration increasing? Well, in simple terms, it's very easy. It's because we are adding, through emissions, more CO2 uh, than nature, uh, the oceans, the forests, etc., can remove. And as long as the emissions are higher than the removals, well, the level of CO2, a little bit like the level of water, uh, the level of water in a bathtub is going to uh, increase. And as you can see, over the last uh, 150 years or so, the increase has been quite steady. I mean, you can actually fit an exponential curve uh, over that period. There have been some fluctuations, but uh, overall, it's an increase by 1.65% every year uh, globally uh, since uh, 1850 or so. And we should go in the other direction. So let's have a look at the um, latest um, uh, contribution from IPCC, the latest report from IPCC about the physical science basis. The IPCC has three working groups. The first working group deals with uh, the climate science uh, aspects and it published its um, report last August. Uh, the other working group, the second one dealing with impacts and adaptation, will publish its report in February. And the uh, third working group will publish its report on mitigation, uh, how to reduce emissions uh, in March uh, next year. It's a report supported uh, by very intense work to more than 200 authors from 65 countries, reviewing uh, 14,000 scientific publications, taking into account almost 80,000 review comments uh, to make this the most solid assessment uh, of climate science uh, you can find. And the situation is dire, actually. The CO2 concentration, which I've just shown, is not only the highest in the last 10,000 years, it's also the highest in at least the last 2 million years. Sea level rise uh, is seeing the fastest rates of increase in at least uh, the last 3,000 years. The sea level has increased over the last 100 years or so already by 20 centimeters, but the rates of uh, increase is accelerating. Arctic sea ice uh, has, the lowest, has its lowest level uh, in terms of area in at least uh, the last thousand years. Uh, glaciers are retreating about everywhere and uh, it, this is unprecedented uh, in at least the last uh, 2,000 two years. Now I've shown you uh, the evolution of the CO2 concentration and temperature. You saw they were evolving in parallel. This is of course not the proof uh, that one is the cause of the other. Uh, to uh, really prove that one is the cause of the other and attribute um, the uh, warming uh, to the increase in uh, the CO2 concentration and the other uh, um, uh, greenhouse gases, we have to, um, of course, use uh, scientific tools such as uh, climate models uh, used, as shown here, to attempt to reproduce the black curve shown here. The black curve is the observed 
the global temperature over the last 150 years. And uh, if you do two kinds of experiments, one using only natural factors important at this time scale, namely small changes in solar activity and volcanic eruptions. Uh, well, if you try to simulate uh, the climate um, uh, as if it would, as it would be um, uh, responding only to those factors, this is the curve you would have. Quite different after 1950 or so from the observed evolution. Now, can one do better by taking into account uh, not only the natural factors, but also the human factors, mostly greenhouse gases, as I explained? Yes, uh, this is the brown curve here. And you see that over time, and each vertical line is an assessment report of the IPCC. The first one was published in 91. The last one, well, a month ago. Uh, and you see that... Um, together with the uh, increasing gap between the two kinds of simulations, the level of confidence, the level of understanding uh, about the influence of greenhouse gases on the warming has only increased. Uh, so in 1990, it said an unequivocal detection of a human effect is not likely for a decade, and it became discernible, it's 95. Then it became likely that most of the warming was due to the um, anthropogenic, anthropogenic uh, effect uh, in 2001. And now the latest is it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. Actually, human influence uh, has warmed the climate as a, at a rate that is unprecedented in at least the last 2,000 years. You see the last 2,000 years shown here with a zoom uh, over the last uh, um, 150 years, and you see how the temperature uh, is now really leaving the, uh, the zone of uh, natural fluctuations uh, seen uh, before. These changes in the average temperature are accompanied by many weather and climate extremes in every region uh, across the globe. Extreme heat becoming more frequent, more intense, heavy rainfall. We have seen what it meant uh, in several parts of the world uh, this summer in Germany, in Belgium, among other places having rainfall becoming more frequent, more intense. I'll come back on, on those two aspects in, in, in a minute. Drought increasing in some regions, for example, in the Mediterranean basin, north of Africa, south of Europe. Fire weather, the, the, con the weather conditions that are favorable for fire are becoming more frequent. Ocean uh, warming uh, becoming more acidic, uh, because uh, of the CO2 we emit, part of it is absorbed by the ocean and this, is, this acidifies the water, losing oxygen as well, which is of course bad for the um, uh, ocean life. And I'd like to focus now on two categories of extremes which are particularly important. Um, uh, temperature extremes, hot temperature extremes, which are becoming, uh, which have become, as the IPCC, these are quotations uh, from the last IPCC report, have become more frequent and more intense across most land regions since the 50s. And heavy precipitation events, which have increased also since then over most land areas, and climate change is likely the main driver. So since I've been asked to uh, talk particularly about those extremes, I will explain why in particular those two categories of events uh, are increasing either in intensity of, or frequency. I think that uh, the intensity and frequency, the increasing intensity and frequency of hot extremes doesn't need long explanations. I mean, we could spend a, long, uh, a lot of time on this diagram showing the probability distribution of temperature. Uh, and when you uh, increase uh, the, um, uh, the average temperature, which is shown by this vertical line here in those uh, Gaussian curve, uh, you see that the probability, which is shown by this area here, is increasing substantially going from this small area in blue here to this big area in red here uh, for a, a small change. I mean, just uh, this is just an illustration. Uh, and uh, I, I think even if we are not um, used to this kind of diagram, uh, you understand that with uh, an increasing um, uh, average temperature, the probability of having 
uh, heat extremes uh, increases significantly. And of course, this can kill. Uh, for example, the summer of 2003 in the European Union, it's 70,000 people who died uh, due to the um, extreme uh, temperature uh, during uh, that uh, summer. Actually, the um, last IPCC report uh, has assessed now that uh, the observed change in hot extremes uh, and also the, um, the confidence uh, that uh, the, the human uh, influence on climate uh, on those hot extremes is present uh, is now much more widespread than just in, in, in Europe. As you can see here, I mean, this is a stylized uh, uh, map of the world. You have North America here, Central America here, South America, Africa, Asia, Australia, small islands. And you see it's almost everywhere uh, that you have this um, color indicating an increasing uh, and then the number of dots uh, show uh, the uh, level of confidence in the, the fact that those increase were due to the human contribution. So now it's now much more uh, than just uh, the um, uh, European Union experiencing hot extremes. Now, why are precipitation uh, events very intense like the one we had uh, this summer in Germany and Belgium, for example? Why is this happening with a warmer climate? Well, the basic reason, reason is very simple. It's a, a law of physics. A, a warmer air can contain um, more water vapor. There's more evaporation uh, when the temperature is higher. And the, um, also the air can contain more water vapor, which means that the available, weight, water, sorry, the available water when uh, the conditions uh, are, are met uh, for that water vapor to condense and become rain or precipitation, um, that available water is, is um, a, a, that amount of available water is larger. It's actually 7% more water vapor for each degree C uh, of um, increase in temperature. And there also the latest IPCC report shows, I mean, it's a little less clear, it's not as clear as for temperature, but it's uh, already quite clear that in many parts of the world, you have uh, increase in uh, heavy precipitation. Uh, and of course, this kind of heavy precipitation um, increases the risk of floods uh, with the terrible human consequences that uh, you know. Uh, in uh, uh, in many parts uh, of the world. This is a picture from Belgium um, uh, last uh, July. Now, we also have um, uh, increases uh, and, and, and some <laughs> decrease, but on, only in one area of the world, in uh, agriculture and ecological drought. Uh, you see that it's mostly increase, which are seen particularly around uh, the Mediterranean, as I indicated uh, earlier. Um, and now, if we want to look at the future, um, how uh, these uh, extreme changes average and extreme changes might uh, change, uh, we need to realize that uh, we cannot predict the future. We can only, only project it. What's the difference? Well, a, a climate projection is based on a hypothetical scenario uh, about, for example, uh, CO2 emissions. How will CO2 emissions evolve in the coming century? Well, there isn't only one um, scenario, and the IPCC actually considered five scenarios. They have complicated names shown here, but you can simplify by saying the highest is the very high scenario, then you have the high scenario, the medium scenario, the low scenario, the very low scenario. And if you see um, the effects of those scenarios on um, the simulated temperature, this is what you get. You see that by the end of the century, the very low scenario uh, is able to stabilize the uh, temperature at a level which is approximately 1.5 degrees C above the pre-industrial uh, level. Remember, we have gained already a little more than one degree um, above the pre-industrial level already. But if we were um, uh, at the um, on, on the very high scenario and um, continually until continuously until the end of the century, uh, we would um, uh, gain a temperature that's approximately 4.5 or even a little more 
uh, degree C above uh, pre-industrial. And if you look at the um, space distribution, you see that uh, it's, uh, I mean, for example, the four degree C word is, is, is quite, um, uh, it, it, it's quite a hot word on continents. And particularly uh, when, you, when you go uh, close to the North Pole um, and the Arctic area uh, where the sea ice has been decreasing, as I explained earlier, you see that there's an amplification with values that are uh, even higher. That's the meaning of this uh, arrow here higher uh, than uh, seven degrees C, that would be really catastrophic. Um, you also see, and the number of dots is proportional to the number of uh, extreme events that with an increase in the global warming temperature, hot temperature events that were happening every 10 years previously, and which have, uh, which are already occurring uh, uh, more frequently uh, 2.8 uh, times more frequently uh, in the, the 1.1, 1.2 degree C world in which we are, uh, it would um, occur almost 10 times uh, more frequently in a 4 degree C world. Now, if you look at a rarer events, a hot extreme event, a 50 year event, you see that uh, the increase is even stronger. I mean, for 4 degree, it's 39 times uh, that it would increase, even for a 1.5 degree C, you know, we wouldn't be safe in, uh, totally safe in a 1.5 degree C world. It would almost be a, multipl a multiplication by 10 uh, of the, uh, the frequency uh, of, you, you, you can also, uh, you should also know that uh, if you combine high temperature and humidity, uh, you can have deadly temperature in some parts of the world, uh, for example, India here. Uh, and uh, this is a big uh, source uh, of concern. There would be changes, of course, in the um, precipitation uh, patterns as well with the drying in the Mediterranean basin I mentioned earlier, and also uh, an increase in heavy precipitation um, frequency over land as shown here. Um, uh, the increase is not as strong uh, as for uh, hot extremes, but still uh, quite uh, significant increase. Uh, and uh, ev e every fraction of a degree uh, matters because with every fraction of a degree, you have a, a further increase uh, of the um, intensity of those extreme events. I see time is flying, so I probably won't. I, I think I gave you... Uh, the most important information. I will skip very quickly on the uh, following slides uh, to get to the um, uh, the last one, which is the most important one, and that will be the reference when you'll be able to find in the next uh, in the coming house uh, all those slides I've shown to you. Uh, but a big source of concern as well is the fact that the ice sheets uh, are starting to melt seriously. This is the amount of water lost every day and a half just by the Antarctic ice sheet. And the result is that sea level uh, is increasing as well. And by the end of the century, if we were on the highest scenario, uh, this would not be excluded more than 1.5 uh, meter. Um, and uh, in the longer term, 2003, 2300, uh, the IPCC wrote a terrible sentence in its last uh, SPM. Sea level rise greater than 15 meter cannot be ruled out with high emissions by 2300. This is much more than um, uh, previously uh, assessed in previous IPCC report. Uh, there are many um, impacts which are driven uh, by climate change and the IPCC. This is, of course, too detailed to uh, look uh, this into the details, but you'll have those slides. And uh, the meaning of this is that uh, for many categories of impacts, climate change as will have an increasing um, impact. So let's um, um, finalize um, our reflection here um, and um, uh, just show this again, which is coming from another IPCC report, a special report on 1.5 degrees C warming. Uh, which, um, and this curve shows, and it's coming from this IPCC report, the shape of the curve uh, of global emissions uh, that would be needed uh, for CO2, um, for net CO2 emissions, uh, if we wanted to stay 
uh, under 1.5 degrees C warming, which is the, the level agreed, the most ambitious level agreed in the Paris Agreement, uh, considered as um, uh, more safe, at least, than um, to stay well below 2 degrees C. And uh, to, to, to stay, um, uh, to, to reach net zero, of course, uh, we, we need to, to change completely uh, the shape of emissions. As I've shown to you, we are still increasing. We, we would need to peak very soon and, and then go down uh, in the next uh, 30 years so that around 2050, uh, we would uh, get to that uh, net zero number. Net zero means do not emit more uh, than um, what natural system uh, can absorb. I'm convinced that all this is much better done in the context of the sustainable development goals of the UN, but I will not uh, delve into this. I don't have the time. Some resources here in French and Dutch for those who are, uh, speak those languages. But uh, here is the website I promised, and I will close on this. Uh, on this website, I hope today, um, before the end of the day, you will find my slides, um, all of them, and you'll have a little more time to look at them um, if you wish. Thank you very much for your attention.